Great. And as it is 12.04, we will get started. So hello, everyone. Welcome to Foresight's fourth webinar uh, on COVID-19 uh, discussion and, and support. Uh, delighted to have some special guests here today. If I just want to make sure that everyone can see my screen properly and uh, and hear me okay, but I, I've seen a few notes that that's, that's possible, so we're in good shape. We're going to dive right in. As you know, this is intended to be quite a casual um, discussion. Like all of you, uh, things are moving at rapid uh, pace, whether it's new government programs, whether it's the survey work, you know, support for, for all of USMEs, um, and lots of engagements and things happening. So i um, going to share a little bit on uh, some context for the discussion today. Going to do a little bit on uh, the survey results. We are going to have an investor panel, share some investment tips from one of our partners at Baskins, uh, and then a little bit on some enhanced support, open discussion and closing statements. So to dive right in, I wanted to provide a little bit of context. Some of you might not be aware that Foresight has embarked on a, a cluster strategy uh, for the province of British Columbia. And of course, we're seeing some of this methodology uh, you know, carry through to some of our colleagues across the country. But as you can see here, we've identified five critical buckets to ecosystem uh, building. And I wanted to sort of bring this to light because that's sort of going to outline all the different topics and, and stakeholder groups that we'd like to get engaged as we look at navigating COVID-19 and of course beyond. So we have of course the SMEs, industry, academia, investors and government. And as a, as a cluster, one of the things we did is we took a step back and we said, what can a successful cluster for BC or Canada look like? And, you know, at the outset, it's marketing communications telling great stories of all the amazing work that you innovators are doing. It's infrastructure and space to innovate. And then there's sort of six buckets of, of programming and opportunity that we think are critical. And as you can see, their capital is one of those main pieces. So we have investors and capital. Um, and fundamentally, in our research over the last six months plus, as well as myself being an EIR, for many years before, before uh, joining Foresight as CEO, you know, we just know that when it comes to you know, finding great people, you know, finding your target market, you know, deploying your technology, of course, capital plays a big role. And a lot of us have been nervous on, um, on knowing how capital markets are going to be affected by COVID-19. And so that's why we've, you know, had this as a main topic of discussion. Um, before we open it up to the great panel that we have here, I, I did commit to sharing with you some of the survey results uh, that we've, we've uh, sort of taken a lead on uh, across the country. And I just also want to shout out to several of our partners that supported that through the Canada Clean Tech Alliance, Mars, um, as well as, um, as some other, um, the, the Center for Social Innovation in Ontario. And if you're not familiar with the Canada Clean Tech Alliance, that includes Octia in Alberta, uh, sorry, in Ontario, Actia in Alberta, and Ecotech Quebec. So if those folks are on the line, thank you. Um, and so what we did is in this first survey, we took a very uh, qualitative uh, approach in terms of programs and, and, and understanding sort of how you've been impacted by COVID-19. And we wanted to take that a step further and get some numbers behind this so that we could really showcase that impact uh, to all the different uh, government partners um, that we work with. And of course, you know, out of the 200 responses, a quick snapshot will show you here that over 50% are projecting layoffs uh, for the sector. Um, Pre-COVID revenue was projected at about 1 billion and that has declined to uh, by about 57% down to 450 million. Our pre-COVID equity capital plan for uh, these 200 plus companies was uh, in the 2 billion range. And that has been reduced to around 1.55 billion. So about a 22% decline. Um, and I think, you know, on the one hand, I think that seems pretty good. On the other hand, we're, we're also seeing that even since this survey, we've had updates that, that the impact is getting greater and greater um, as, as this pandemic continues to, to affect all of us. In terms of the debt plan, uh, pre-COVID debt was estimated to be around 432 million, a 24% decline on that so far. And as you know, some of the government programs that have come out are debt related, um, whether it's the small business loan or some of the, the um, EDC and BDC programming. Um, but of course, there's some, some non-debt items as well, um, mechanisms. 
And then of course, since March 15th, uh, so far there's been a projected $294 million um, that has um, sort of been removed from the, the Canada clean tech ecosystem in even that short period of time. Out of the survey results, something that we were delighted to see is that about a third are pre-revenue and the rest are, are early revenue growth and mature companies. I think this is just a testament to how clean tech for Canada is becoming a more mature sector. Um, as we know, when companies start to grow and mature, often you get more spin-off companies, um, many executives and, and team members are getting experience in how to operate clean tech companies. And so that means that more companies will continue to come and solve um, amazing problems that all of you are working on. The sectors that were represented were, were very broad, very similar to the, uh, the sectors in our core cluster work, uh, natural resource sector, agriculture, food, forest projects, uh, forest products, my apologies, transportation, built environment, um, construction and, and utilities. So pretty uh, impactful slide in terms of how clean tech has truly infiltrated all of the different sectors across our great country. Jobs. Um, now diving into some of the details, you'll see a breakdown um, sort of by per major region, but um, there is so far an estimated loss of over 51% jobs. Um, and what we also did is look at pre-COVID um, full-time employee counts with the median at around eight and the average of around 18. Um, so really interesting. I mean, as you all know, as leaders of your companies, every individual plays such a critical role in your team because you're all wearing so many hats. And so even losing three, five, four people will have a major uh, impact. Um, and so one of the messages that we're talking about is if we can't retain those people, if you can't retain those people, um, how does that impact your ability to recover more quickly relative to other sectors? And so we're continuing to share that message and, and look for more feedback and input from you on that. Um, revenue as well, um, pre-COVID uh, revenue was projected at 1 billion, uh, decrease of about 43%. Different provinces have different impacts. Um, I think, you know, one notably here, Alberta, obviously we're, we're very aware of, of what's happening in Alberta and um, the energy sector there is, is suffering and that is impacting a lot of companies that have been working on helping uh, the oil sector with innovation and transition to, to um, some new technologies. And so that's devastating. Um, the interesting part is that um, the, the numbers are reflected both at the median and average um, projection as well. So the median's gone from 2 million down to 832,000. And of course the average um, from six down to, to uh, three. So about a, a 55% loss of, in projections uh, at one month since the pandemic. Now the two interesting pieces for the investor discussion that we'll have today, uh, the first is on equity financing. Uh, so the projected was um, 2 billion with um, the post COVID 1.6 and the median is around 2 million. Uh, and post COVID medium is around, oh, can you please mute? Post-COVID median is around uh, 700,000. Oh, oh, my apologies. I'm just going to mute everyone here. Mute all. Does that not work? There we go. Thank you. Um, I, with Zoom, it happens every time, but we're just happy we have over 100 folks listening in and, and joining the conversation. Um, but the BC was is really fascinating on the debt financing. Oh, sorry, um, little overview of the debt financing. Uh, the projection was about 432 million in debt. Post COVID is 328. Interestingly enough, BC actually reported an increase in in debt financing. So uh, I'd be curious uh, to hear from our BC companies on the line. You know, they're feeling bullish. Um, has that been, has that mentality changed? And so we'll be meeting with some of you one-on-one -on -one to discuss some of those findings as well. In terms of additional comments, um, you'd like some programs to consider longer term impacts of the pandemic, erosion of sales pipeline, delayed technology and product development and loss of key employees. Um, you're looking for grant opportunities to relieve economic impacts open to lower interest debt facilities. So um, perhaps more willing to take on debt with lower interest facilities. Um, a comment on critical need to accelerate shred payments. And I, I did want to share with you that 
myself and some other colleagues across Canada do have regular calls with folks and, and we have heard that that was addressed and that shred payments are now starting to be made and that became a priority when we had calls with them two weeks ago. So they're trying to act fast to get that uh, SRND tax credit uh, money back in your hands um, so that that is a, a, some cash for you to su support you um, during this tough time. Consider getting universities and test facilities back up and running. So for a lot of pre-revenue and even early stage revenue companies and beyond, you're relying heavily on university and academics to validate all the different things that you're working on, perhaps even with physical space. And so uh, we've shared that feedback with them as well. And that in general, it'd be great to have um, some support on how to best navigate. And I know the Clean Growth, um, Clean Growth Hub and, and others are um, on standby. And I'm sure if um, Eric's on the line, he'll chime in. If not, um, there are different resources to ensure that you're able to navigate all of the right programs um, for you. Before we jump on to the panel, just a few things I did want to cover on recommendations. So myself and, and other colleagues from the Canada Clean Tech Alliance, um, again, Ecotech Quebec, Octia and Actia, we've started to look at different recommendations and we are going to be reaching out to everyone um, by email if you are interested in giving feedback on some of this. Um, we need your feedback. Um, but some of the recommendations are to look at programs and recovery packages that de-risk clean tech investment by providing tax ded deductions, um, supporting early stage entrepreneurs by setting up federal safes. Um, so a little bit of a different program than, than BDC and EDC currently offer. Offer federal loan guarantees for clean tech projects. And even pre-COVID, we, we, we were hearing from some of the later stage companies that this would be a very um, um, a, a very good program to consider. And even now, post-COVID, I do want to let you know that if you have shovel-ready projects, please reach out to myself and the Foresight team. We will put you on a list that, that is a huge interest for, for many of, of the different uh, ministries and, and how they'd like to see people get back to work and help support the transition to, to a green economy. Um, expanding the Federal ICS Challenge Program. If you're not familiar with the Innovative Solutions Canada Program, that is a program that um, basically helps ministries within the ministries and their operations become more innovative and deploy technologies. And, uh, and they've been doing a lot of work in the plastics sector and that has broadened over the last year. And so there's obviously, you can see some interest to see some private coalitions to, to leverage those fundings more broadly. Um, and expand the 100% accelerated capital cost allowance beyond um, energy generation and energy uh, conservation to, to broader clean tech projects. Um, some other recommendations to replicate the Department of National Defense Industrial Technology Benefits Program from the US. Um, green public procurement through integration of life cycle assessment methodologies. So really getting government procurement top of mind. And I know that they're looking at ways to do that both pre-COVID and now um, surely post. Update and simplify existing granting programs. Uh, and I know um, we've already seen recently that um, NRCI RAP has been um, uh, awarded $250 million to support the innovation sector and uh, create a recovery granting program that offers grant uh, for training and rehiring. Finally, ensure that uh, GHG target commitments for all industry or recovery packages. And again, we've seen some of that through the recent um, abandoned oil uh, field um, program that was announced a couple of days ago by the Prime Minister. Launch Green Growth Hub led review of federal and provincial regulatory barriers to clean growth. So seeing some more standardization across provinces led by um, the Clean Growth Hub and 100% uh, matching uh, federal to provincial um, investment opportunities. So these are some things that, um, that are here. We are gonna continue to work through these recommendations. They're early stage, but I wanted to share them with you because you're all on the line and this is an open dialogue. We're here to work together and figure out the best path forward to ensure you know, our sector is, is, is you know, tough and um, when we come out of this and well supported. A few quick program announcements with, which some of you have seen and next week we will have some of these folks on the webinar. Um, NRCI wrapped 250 million for, for innovators. The regional agencies were also given uh, 750 million. So that would include folks like WED and our, their counterparts uh, across the country. Futurepreneur, so if you're 35 or under, it's not me, uh, $20 million um, through their programming. And I believe it's 15,000 and then that can be leveraged to BDC for 45. And they may have um, increased that amount a little bit as well. 
and then 1.25 to the to orphan wells. So stay tuned next week as we um, focus on a government engagement session where we outline a lot of these programs for all of you. Okay, I've spoken for a solid 10 minutes. Let's move on to really exciting. I've got uh, Shirley Speakman and uh, Matt Eagers from Cycle Capital and Breakthrough Energy respectively. Um, Shirley and Matt, if you please unmute and, uh, and bring yourself online, that would be amazing. Great, let's see where Matt is. I'm sure he'll pop up here shortly. Awesome, hello. So, um, you know, as a kind of leading into this, we're seeing that a lot of folks are reporting uh, some impacts into their ability to raise equity capital. Um, and I think this is just the early stages. But before we jump into that discussion, I'd love for each of you to just to tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, and your organizations or your, your, your VCs, and then we'll dive into more. So maybe Shirley, why don't we start with you? Sure, so I think the bio is, is up on the screen. So I'll talk about the stuff that isn't on the bio. Um, and what's not on the bio is that Cycle is a platform fund. So we have actually five funds uh, under management, um, just under half, half a billion of assets under management. One of those funds is based in China. The other four are clean tech funds for essentially North America, although we will look outside of North America. Our, our sweet spot, our series, uh, late A's, B's, and early C's. Um, and really, you know, that, that definition is unique to every investor, but the way we look at it is that we do not want to take on technology risk. What we're willing to take on is, is what I'll describe as engineering or product development risk, but we, we want to know that the technology does what you say it can do. Um, our first check size is typically three to $5 million Canadian. Um, and then we'll reserve anywhere from 10 to $15 million over the life of a, a portfolio company because we are firm believers and experience tells us that it's never a one and done. Um, and it's important to make sure that you have capital in reserve to support companies as they move forward. Um, and for, for, for uh, what you might find interesting is that we, we are finding innovative ways of continuing to do due diligence. Um, on, on companies that were either in our portfolio or in our pipeline before COVID hit, and even those that are coming toward to us now. Um, it, it's not the same way as, as it was done in the past. Um, and, you know, I think venture capitalists need to learn how, how to change their mode of operation in order to accommodate our new reality. But that's why one of the things that we look for are, are trusted syndicate partners. Um, having developed a relationship with entrepreneurs over time. Uh, but uh, if it gives people comfort, we are actually actively looking for deals in the market. Amazing. Amazing. Matt? How are you? Um, uh, I'm well. How are you? Thanks for having me. Good. Absolutely. So uh, I guess like Shirley, I'll just uh, talk a little bit about what Breakthrough is. Breakthrough is a clean tech or climate tech or energy transition uh, venture capital firm. Um, we invest in companies where we think we can get a, a venture return and that um, are doing something that would have a massive impact on greenhouse gas emissions if it scales. Um, in particular, we look for, for um, companies that uh, we think could have uh, mitigate half a gigaton of greenhouse gases annually by 2050. So things that can get really big. Um, we we search across the economy and across the world for those. Um, we focus our efforts on five areas, buildings and infrastructure, food and ag, electricity generation, um, storage and transmission, transportation, and what am I missing in manufacturing, which pretty much covers the entire economy uh, and and um, something like 88% of emissions or 90% or something like that. Um, we, we, we're an earlier stage investor. Sounds like a little earlier than um, Shirley and Cycle. We typically come in at the seed or series A stage, um, sometimes even pre-seed, sometimes series B, but that's generally our sweet spot. Depending on the stage company, we might invest, you know, one to 10 million in an initial investment. And, um, like Shirley, we think one of the lessons of Clean Tech 1.0 is these things um, often take longer and more money than you think. It's it's hard to scale up atoms, um, 
And uh, so we, we reserve heavily for each round and we like to invest with syndicates. We often share um, lead investment roles. Um, we know we, we want deep pockets and lots of expertise and help around the table. And those might be from other um, financial venture investors or from uh, corporate investors or even governments and government funds and all those sorts of uh, sources of capital. And we do have some investments in Canada already, although I think on the other side, um, you know, don't know if there's any Atlantic Pacific rivalry, but I uh, would be would love to get one on the Pacific side. Um, the fund is based in Boston, and there's a handful of us in the Bay Area, which is where I am. We are active. I think we'll close two new investments this week, close in funds. Um, they're small, um, but, uh, but we are definitely investing new money. Um, we're putting, uh, we'll also be funding soon follow on investments in several portfolio companies. Um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's trendy and cool as a venture capitalist to say that you're, that we are open for business Every venture capitalist likes to look like they love risk, um, even though they don't. Um, so we are open for business. Um, you know, I think it's, it is hard, harder, certainly to raise money right now. It's going to take longer. Um, it's tricky to figure out how to invest in this world where you can't see people in person. And, and even trickier, I think, is seeing stuff in person. You know, we invest in a lot of stuff. Um, and it's, it's hard to get excited about a company that's doing something, say, in a wet lab without going to see their lab um, and seeing how, you know, how it works, how does it function. Uh, pictures are worth a thousand words and a tour is worth 10,000. Um, but we're, you know, we're, we're, we're soldiering forward. We're not, uh, we're not saying that we wouldn't invest in, in something like that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see how it all shakes out, but we're eager to meet entrepreneurs. Um, the climate crisis is not slowing down. It's not changing. Um, and, uh, and we're, we're excited to continue plowing forward. That's great. That's great. A couple of sort of pre-worked questions, and I do welcome folks to to just shoot me a note if you've got some questions for uh, Shirley and Matt. Um, but you know, in terms of assessing companies that you are just meeting, what are some of the characteristics that you're looking for um, to continue to move ahead in sort of the process, Shirley? So I think Matt, Matt articulates it well. Um, it, it, it will be a little bit more challenging. Um, so I, I think people should expect it to take a little bit longer. Um, the companies that we're, we're looking at closing on are companies that we had already been familiar with. So I had already met the entrepreneur. I had already met the team. Um, but these new opportunities, are, they are going to take a bit longer, assuming that we still have to do business the way that we're doing at video conference and, and uh, digitally. It, it is going to take us longer. So making, from my perspective, an, uh, a company that can help keep me engaged, uh, that can help facilitate a way um, to, to show me what the technology can do, um, if there is a way I can reference things, I think it's really important. So case studies, uh, I think from my perspective, um, the customer calls I've been doing have been instrumental uh, in helping me get comfortable with the, the state of a, a, an opportunity that I'm looking at. Um, but I think an, a, an underpinning has to be that things, assuming that we have to continue to do things digitally, things are just gonna take, take longer. Matt? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good summary. Uh, um, given, given that it's hard to meet people in person and see things, I think references, um, corporate partnerships, those things of the like, um, for people that have met the entrepreneurs and seen the technology before will probably be of increasing value, uh, to us, um, and strong founder track records also a value, um, but, you know, at the heart of it, we're still looking for technological innovations that um, can scale massively. Um, you know, and that's that's one I think for us in particular, that's if there's one reason I pass on a deal, uh, an opportunity to work with a founder once it's you know met some sort of basic level of credibility, it's that it doesn't scale. 
um, just mm -hmm. to put the half a gigaton in perspective, Exxon Mobil is today a half a gigaton company uh, in the wrong direction. Um, but so if, if we don't see a technology um, having the sort of impact that Exxon Mobil has today, um, then it's not a good fit for us. So there are, there are many wonderful things I see um, that don't that qu don't qualify that for that, but that I would love to fund, and um, you know I think are are good companies could make money, could have an impact, but they're they may not be a fit for breakthrough because they don't have that kind of potential scale. Awesome. I apologize. I, I have a dog, and and uh, she likes <laughs> to bark right now. Um, maybe we'll go in reverse order. Matt, how has breakthrough? Uh, or has Breakthrough made adjustments to how they evaluate um, companies? Um, and what should we help the, the founders know when they're uh, managing their expectations on valuations? Yeah, yeah, well, valuation, that's one of the places where I was gonna go. Um, valuations are connected to the world economy, whether in private or public markets. Um, and so I think, uh, valuations have been really high the last couple of years. And, um, you know, whenever there's a swing, they usually swing further um, than baseline. So, you know, I would expect valuations to go maybe below average at this point. Um, that's, you know, that's kind of our expectation. Um, the, other, the other thing that's really important too is this is always important, but I think we're putting extra focus on it right now in an era where it takes longer and it's more challenging to raise money is uh, founders should be really crisp about how much they're raising and why and how that's going to get them to the milestones that they need to hit to create the next round of value. Um, and I think you know being more conservative in that regard is probably better um, in this area than coming in super aggressive and saying, look, you know, we're going to hit all these wonderful milestones in six months and then have revenue of 10 million six months after that. It's just uh, uh, that can always hurt credibility. And in this time and market, I think that risking your credibility in that way is even more, um, more damaging or, or more risky. So have a conservative plan, um, a reasonable plan, and really think about what you're going to do with the money that you're asking for from investors that's going to create value. And, and you know, what I tell investors is, uh, or companies is you've got to think about doubling the value, your post money value with these milestones. Um, so why would an investor, you know, 12 months from now, 18 months from now, two years from now, when you've hit these milestones, why would an investor think your company is worth twice, um, at least twice what it is right now? Great, Shirley? Jeez, Matt's done a great job. I think I think um, on the valuation issue, you know, we we closed our fund um, more than a year ago, and we actually were on the sidelines for all of last year because we couldn't make the venture math work. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, an 136 million dollar fund uh, with another close to come, we we only made two investments last year. Um, so we, we are hoping that valuations come down. Um, and, but, but at the, at the end of the day, we're a 12 year life fund, right? And, and we have time to make the value happen. Uh, it's just what we saw last year. We just, we just couldn't see how we could get our venture capital return. Um, that's necessary, uh, and what our LPs expect. So we believe that valuations will come down. Um, we understand that it's going to take longer for companies to achieve what they need to achieve and, and hence valuations should come down. But we, we also with our fund said it's, it's, it's a 12 year life because we know things take longer. So hopefully on the other end, we'll have given our, our portfolio companies the opportunity to actually increase their valuation at, at the exit. Great, great. We've got a question here from Brandon. Uh, Brendan, how can a founder accelerate the due diligence process? 
in general or specifically now. <laughs> so I'll, maybe, I, both. I, maybe we I, get COVID uh, and, a, yeah. and a non-COVID. I, I think, I think for, I, I'm in a little bit of a different place than, than Matt is um, because I do slightly, I don't go as early. And, and so much I think of what Matt does, does require it's early stage stuff, right? Uh, so I can rely on proxies to a certain degree. And by that, I mean, if there's a co-investor in that opportunity, um, I know I can, I can talk to that, that potential co-investor uh, and say, tell me about the company, right? So that, for, for me, um, if you can find a way to get to me through a trusted network, that certainly accelerates the process. If a deal has an existing investor that I'm already a co-investor with, that I think will help raise it. As I'm, as I'm triaging the opportunities, I look, uh, I look for reasons to say yes, and, and a, an opportunity that has a co-investor that I trust is a reason to say yes. Um, so that's, what, that's one tip I would, I would offer. Matt? That's, I completely agree with those, those comments, um, getting through, um, you know, connecting to people in the ecosystem that are trusted and experienced and have a track record of success is really helpful. Um, uh, you know, a couple things that uh, I find helpful, um, be organized. If you want to talk to, to, to uh, Breakthrough, be really clear about why you think you can get to half a gigaton. Um, with some reasonable math, hopefully depending on first order effects. Um, we place a lot less value on second and third order effects. So, you know, if you're going to do something that's going to do something else, that's going to do something else that gets to that half a gigaton, that's probably not going to work for us. Um, you know, the math, uh, the math needs to be well thought out, but reasonably simple um, for us to, to see the, that greenhouse gas benefit. Um, having a good understanding of the market. I'm amazed how many times I talk to founders and they've got a lot of um, uh, discussion or, or thoughts about how big the market is, but they can't really back that up um, with either good data that they've generated on their own or, or um, some, you know, credible reports um, or analysis from somebody else that, that sizes up a market or an opportunity. Um, and that doesn't mean, now, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in, uh, in you know, great founders in a, a market that can grow into a much bigger market. So it is, it's not like they have to have, um, suggest they can capture the whole thing from day one. There can definitely be market expansion. I think that's how a lot of great companies work. Um, but but uh, I like to see thoughtful analysis on how big the opportunity is. Um, and, uh, and thoughtful analysis about the competition or about what they're up against, especially from incumbents, is important. And I think in, in a lot of the things that we um, invest in, um, understanding that um, incumbents aren't sitting still either. Um, neither, are, neither are other new companies. Um, so if, if uh, you know, let's say you're making a new lithium ion battery technology, um, make sure you're forecasting where you're going to be in five years against the 20% the march downward of the cost curve of existing technology, um, for, for example. Um, yeah. And then I think, you know, going back to the comments that we've already made, a good financial model, um, a good reasonable expectation of the cost that you'll incur over the next two years, I'd really focus it on two or maybe three years, um, so that we can see that the founders thought a lot about costs um, against progress and milestones during that period. So we know how much money the company needs and what value they'll create with that money. Great. And, and building on that, Matt, would you expect that most of the, the companies who are you know, presenting their, their projections, they'll have done quite a strategic assessment of the COVID-19 impacts of those numbers? Um, I think so. I think so. Although, you know, it's so, it's so hard to tell. And this is why investments are taking a long time right now. Um, obviously, you can't go in with a plan that's not adjusted for COVID-19 right now. Um, but I, I don't know that anyone's, you know, idea about what the world's going to be like in six months is any better than anyone else's ideas. And, um, you know, it's going to be different. But, you know, will we be 
50% back to normal in six months or 75% or 0%. I don't know. I think you could make good cases for any of those. Um, so I wouldn't get too hung up in, in uh, trying to forecast what the world is going to be like. Um, but, you know, you definitely have to take into account that hiring going to, may go slower. Um, partnerships with big companies may go slower. Sales may go slower because you might not be able to meet um, you know, your potential prospects at conferences and, and that sort of thing. Um, so a, a clear, a reasonable and clear-eyed assessment of that, I think, is helpful. Great. Yeah, it's been really fascinating for Foresight. We've seen an increase in, in folks, you know, uh, to apply for Accelerator and things like that. So it's, um, you know, people are leaning up, they're being capital efficient, but they still realize they need help and uh, to navigate sort of this new norm. And, and some of the, you know, questions we get asked a lot is, should we pivot? Should we do this? Should we, you know, stay the course? And, and, you know, a lot of it's, it depends. And, but there's some scenarios where this is an opportunity to really take a step back at your business model and resiliency and, and, and planning and, and make sure that you've really thought through some of these um, pieces, because we never know when um, situations are going to hit, just like what happened in, in 2008-9. Um, Shirley, Matt, do you, Shirley, do you have any final statements? It's 1239. We've got a, another um, speaker to bring on board and he, he's actually can join the conversation. Um, but maybe before we do that, Shirley, any other final thoughts that advice, tips that we should give the companies who are looking well, to raise? Um, I, I think for our existing portfolio, um, we have uh, really encouraged them to think hard about their cash runway. Um, and making sure, well, making sure they leverage all the great programs that you're, you're spearheading, you're trying to spearhead with the, the feds. But I think, I think today cash is king. So being very conscientious about how you're spending your money and to Tim and point, how that spend is creating value is probably a, a solid reflection for everybody in today's, in today's environment. Matt? Yeah. Uh, that's a good point. Um, uh, be frugal mm -hmm. uh, in your spending and your spending plans. Um, um, what else? You know, I, I, I don't over focus on COVID. Um, you know, I, I think when I talk to a founder and hear a pitch, I still really want to hear about the technology. I really want to hear about the team and I really want to hear about the market. Those are the most important things. Um, and, um, you know, Jeanette, I think they need to, like you said, they need to address um, the world as it is. Um, but, but uh, I, you know, I don't want to hear the first three slides of a pitch be about how COVID's going to change things. I, I, I really want to still hear about the technology, the company, and the, and, uh, the market, and the team. Jeanette, do you want to ask your Oh, sorry. It's Dave, it's Dave Punch. Do you mind if I ask a quick question? I actually sent it to via chat. Oh, sure, yes, go ahead, Dave. Uh, one, yeah. one quick question, that'd be great. Yeah, one quick question. I know you guys focus on technology. Um, I'm wondering if you'll consider sort of um, connective tissue that leverages two or three existing proven technologies in our business models slash products, or does it have to be sort of a pure play technology? Um, it does have gigaton uh, potential, by the way. It's in transportation emissions I'll go on mute uh, hard hard to say from a description possibly I mean nothing you said would rule it out okay I, I would say the same Jeanette that I didn't hear anything that would make it a no I mean it sounds like it's in clean tech if it's got gigaton reductions so um, sounds fair cool Awesome. So please, you know, thank you, Shirley. Thanks, Matt. Stay on the line. Um, but I did want to add in John Conlin. He's one of uh, Foresight's partners um, from Faskin. And unfortunately, he can't share any happy news today um, that I think is coming down the pipe. But I, uh, um, he, we did want to have John sort of share some of what he's seeing from an investment perspective um, at Faskin's and all of the different partners that he and clients that he works with. John, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me? Awesome. Can hear you. Did you, do you have your video live too? Sorry, I had to. I do. Oh, great. And you've got a beautiful background too. I, I sometimes change my background to the space. And then I have a thing that says social distancing. 
But That's, I, uh, that was the joke. You just stole my opening <laughs> joke. Lawyers, lawyers aren't funny. I had the whole thing lined up. Oh no, <laughs> I'm kind of feeding it for you. Um, but welcome, welcome. So why don't you jump in and, and maybe share sort of what you're seeing and what's happening? I've got a couple yeah. of questions too. For all yeah, of no, of course. And and, uh, and in giving kind of a, a bit of a perspective, happy to have Shirley or Matt uh, to uh, weigh in or, or offer some pushback on what we're seeing. Because I think I think part of uh, what we've seen is that there's a lot of different experiences right now. Um, I would say what what we're seeing is is consistent with some of the guidance that we're getting out of the U.S. and that's uh, lower median uh, round sizes. Companies are raising less. Um, some indications are that we're starting uh, to see similar experiences to what happened in 08. Although uh, to to you know make a clean tech uh, friendly. Uh, turn to that. Uh, clean tech seems to be doing quite well, at least in our portfolio. And and uh, from a brief canvas of the participants here, we, you know, many of our, our companies are here. So uh, hello to all of our existing clients. Um, I know just to cut to the chase, uh, we're asked multiple times a day, what, uh, you know, what, what should companies do? And I think, um, you know, one starting point, and of course, remember, I am a lawyer. So we do like talking about paperwork is, you know, when you're talking about how to how to get funded as fast as you can, make sure that your house is in order. So you can, to a certain degree, eliminate some execution risk by making sure that, to the extent you can you can get there, you're you know you've got your your data room ready, you've got all of your corporate records, all of your company records ready for for diligence, so that the Shirley's and the Matts of the world have one less reason to say no. Um, we're, we you know what we're telling our investors is to plan for the world not going back to normal, certainly before the end of the year, but likely Q1. And on that basis, think about what your burn rate and runway is. And you know, if you do need to be raising money now, uh, adjusting to a new normal. And that new normal, we, we are starting to see is going to look uh, you know, a, a couple of different uh, in ways in a couple of different than, than what you saw in, in 2019. Um, certainly valuation drops. Uh, and I think Shirley and Matt both touched on that. But, w but within the terms of rounds itself, I think we're starting to see, um, you know, some terms that are much more, uh, much more um, investor friendly. So things such as um, more uh, investor friendly anti-dilution rights, investor friendly PREF dividend rights, potentially redemption rights coming in that kind of uh, guarantee liquidity after a certain period of time. Um, and also, you know, and it's something that affects uh, kind of founders individually. We're, we're even seeing uh, investors seek um, vesting top ups over founder stock in later stage rounds. So all of those are, you know, can be complicated topics. And, you know, I would, I would uh, encourage all of you to consult with, you know, your, your advisors on all of those. But but I did want to give some specific examples of things that we're starting to see. So what does that all mean? I think, you know, some of the takeaways that we're trying to leave our companies with is, you know, if, if you're at the point where you need to raise money right now, you know, as a starting point, go to, go to existing investors first. Those are the investors that you've established relationships with. Those are the investors where there might be some flexibility with respect to existing anti-dilution rights in the context of a down round. Um, it's going to be very challenging to uh, raise money from new investors. Uh, I think that that's just true, and and we try to you know we try to give the unvarnished truth wherever we can. Um, and raising smaller amounts to the extent that you are looking at terms that didn't necessarily align with your expectations based on what you were seeing your competitors raise money at in 2019 or earlier. Um, you know what what would it take to get you to halfway through next year or early next year when, you know, some people's crystal balls, although no, no crystal ball is, is certainly very, seems to be very effective right now, says that we might start to see a creep back to normal. So those are some of the things that we, you know, we're starting, we're, we're trying to leave companies with as far as actionable advice that, that I thought might be useful to share now. But certainly, you know, broadly across, broadly across all of these conversations is don't panic, you know, plan thoughtfully um, and, uh, and, and, you know, as much information as you can get from venues such as this are going to help you, you know, make decisions for your company with, uh, with the benefit of as much kind of context as possible. 
asked earlier. Matt, do you have any comments on, on some of John's feedback? I would rather I would recommend to to founders that they uh, they do their best to avoid a lot of the, the extra investor bells and whistle terms. Um, may not be possible, um, and it's better to get some money than have your company die. But I would, if, if it's my advice, you know that if you sacrifice valuation and get a clear clean term sheet, yeah, um, I think that will be better later on for raising more money from, from a, a good investor. Um, I, I'd love to hear what Shirley says about this, but I think, you know, man, I really don't like following behind a complicated term sheet with all kinds of other, or a complicated, sorry, uh, you know, round, a uh, complicated investment with all sorts of terms. I, I don't really want to do that. And once those things get in there, they exist forever. Um, it's really hard to get them out. Yeah, Matt, I think, I think, um, uh, you know, I, I, I align in your, I, I'm aligned with your thinking. I think, unfortunately, there will be people, uh, there will be investors who will, who will use this as an opportunity to, to secure that. Um, so it, it really does go down to, you know, everything has its price. Uh, so, and that's why I think valuations are going to, to come down. Uh, not only just because of the economic situation, but there, there may be, in fact, pressure to exchange valuation for terms. And um, yeah, that's, what, guidance, I just, that that's my be, advice is, yeah. I, my advice is exchange guidance. valuation for terms. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. This is Beth Lockney. Um, I, I'm going to jump in here hi, and and say hi. Uh, I, I have experience with this on the, in, on the uh, entrepreneur side. And I, my experience, uh, Matt, is is that, and and Shirley as well, is that when you make the argument that it's not good for the investor to try to cram this stuff too hard because it makes it unappealing for the follow-on investors, um, and therefore the current investor who's trying to who's trying to uh, um, play too hard, too much hardball with the term sheet with all of these terms is actually making it unappealing for the investment, the next investment. Uh, sometimes there's quite a bit more wiggle room than, than you think. And, and I do understand, Shirley, I understand your point, but Matt, I completely agree with you. Um, it, to the extent that, that there is some negotiating room on it, it for, for the entrepreneurs here on this call, definitely think about giving up your, uh, some of your valuation in order to keep these terms as simple as possible because the uglier and more poisonous a, a term sheet is for the follow-on round the less wiggle room you're going to have and the fewer um investors you're going to have at the table for the next round yeah that Beth, i totally agree as i, as I said I, I i i agree with matt's thinking i think that it is an, but i do know that there will be investors who who are going to do exactly what John talks about. Like, yeah. let's, let's have Absolutely. a high liquidation preference. Let's try to engineer a financial return. Yeah. And I have unfortunately had to go in and, and unwind those. And, yes. and that just extends um, negotiations on the subsequent round. So, um, yeah. you know, Matt, I, as wearing, uh, although you can see me, but wearing my company council hat, I certainly <laughs> agree with you. Uh, where we've been successful in 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 some negotiations and of course there are cases where uh this is the deal on the table and these are the terms that are are being offered by the vc uh there is a there's a, a middle ground that can be achieved through you know kind of thoughtful negotiation and so in some cases there were terms that were imposed upon us in term sheets that will fall away upon the achievement of certain milestones or things of that nature and so I, I think, again, as a takeaway to the companies on the call is know that, um, you know, re reach out to your advisors and, and, you know, know that these dynamics are, are we're seeing these dynamics at play, but also that um, we, we've also seen kind of reasonable compromise, uh, you know, when, when there has been pushback based on, you know, based on, uh, you know, arguments for um, some of these terms being, being too, uh, too punitive, if you will. Amazing. Thank you. It's good to see more dynamic perspectives, right? Um, I mean, again, Foresight with about 350 companies engaged in different ways over the last six years, 
you know, some of the founders, they have experience in navigating these environments because they've been through it before and other more um, less, less seasoned uh, or first time entrepreneurs who haven't done a raise before, they wouldn't know to look for those indicators. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's important that we have resources available and that we are open, open communication. And I mean, I think ultimately my, in my view, having raised money myself is you wanna find the investor group that aligns with you, right? It, like not everyone is a, is a fit. And um, I'm not sure, I mean, and that goes both ways. Right. It's not it's not just about the technology. It's it's about the team and can they execute and gosh, we have to work together for as Shirley mentioned 12 years. <laughs> so you, you want to be latching on to people that you know you're going to enjoy talking to uh, five, you know, 10 years down the road. Um, but yeah. Okay, we are coming up to 1255. Does anyone have any other comments or questions? Um, Shirley, Matt, John? I'll just uh, I'll just say that I didn't I didn't go into the you know what Jeanette and I talked about was uh, was talking about kind of term sheet specific items but what I didn't go into was all of the extremely valuable government resources that uh, that 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 companies are starting to um, make use of and and so I know those are, those um, uh, summaries of those are available on, on Foresight's website but I'll also post to the Zoom chat uh, the Faskin Tech blog so I will give a shout out to Faskin and. Uh, Post that Absolutely. there, and there's lots of nice summaries there if, if anybody wants to read them. That's great. No, I really appreciate that, um, John. Yeah, any resources that companies can can uh, can use is fan is fantastic. And as I, I do have some other questions, but maybe it's not for today. But um, you know, is there an opportunity for Canada to do some interesting things that attract investment from a recovery standpoint? And I know we've already heard of BDCs matching um, fund program to VCs. And I'm not sure, um, Shirley and, and Matt, if you're on those, I imagine Shirley probably is on top of it, but, um, but there's an opportunity to, to have BDC do those matching funds with, with, with VCs and uh, happy, to, happy to connect those dots, dots as well. Okay, um, open discussion. You know, we always end up using a lot of the time with the, the speakers, um, but as you all know, we are completely open and here to support any challenges or questions or comments you have. This will be shared uh, by uh, my great colleague Astrid after this. Um, oh, I see a few more questions. Maybe I'll, I'll uh, there's a few questions in open discussion. Maybe I will answer some of those. So from Michael, would you consider proposing flow through shares within BC to the federal government? So, um, so Michael, or Mitchell, sorry, if you weren't aware, uh, the Canada Clean Tech Alliance actually put forward an initiative for throw through um, tax credits for the clean tech sector uh, about uh, February 1st to 8th that um, that launched and, and that campaign was introduced to our federal government partners. And I do know that my colleague Jason in Alberta and ourselves here have put flow through share credits um, as um, as um, an opportunity to to excite investment as we come into into recovery so it's definitely top of mind and if you haven't checked out the uh, Canada Clean Tech website please do so and you'll see some information on it there and um, and given that government is open to feedback on recovery programs it's 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 one of many um, of a long list of ideas and, and opportunities that is being explored okay I don't think there's any more questions so Hope everyone has um, a relatively good uh, rest of your week. And uh, I know it's it's tough for a lot of you um, entrepreneurs on the channel and we're here to help and support. Um, reach out if you need introductions to everyone and, and thank you to, to Shirley and Matt and John. I really appreciate your time today and, and, and uh, look forward to more engagements and, and conversations in the future. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.